Last week, we looked at how milk distributors, nurses, and other people on the ground drastically improved public health in Taiwan during the 20th century. Tonight, in part three of our special report on the history of epidemic and disease prevention, we turn to another cornerstone of the national health care system, and that is vaccines. Today, most Taiwanese get vaccinated for at least 10 diseases in the course of childhood. Join us as we go back over half a century for a close look at Taiwan's immunization history. In 1952, at the advice of the WHO, the now defunct Taiwan Provincial Government and National Taiwan University established a vaccine research and manufacturing facility. At the facility, researchers injected lab rats with encephalitis causing bacteria to stimulate their immune systems to produce antibodies. They then extracted brain tissue from the rats to develop all sorts of vaccines. They would inject the Japanese encephalitis virus into the brain of a live rat so it would contract the disease. Later, if you killed it and extracted its brain, you could make one cc of vaccine. If you wanted 10,000 cc of vaccine, you would need 10,000 rats. Li Jingyun is a key figure in the history of Taiwan's vaccine development. He was born in 1927 and graduated from NTU's College of Medicine. While working at NTU Hospital's pediatric ward, he encountered cases of polio, Japanese encephalitis, and measles on a daily basis. He came to realize that only through researching vaccines and starting with prevention could diseases be put to rest. At one point, there was a diphtheria outbreak. Many people died in the emergency room. During the polio outbreak, hospital rooms everywhere were filled with children stricken with polio. There were children with respiratory paralysis who couldn't breathe, so they had to rely on an iron lung. We only had one iron lung, and treatment is very long for each patient. When the next patients showed up, they couldn't be treated in time, and doctors could only watch as they died. To save these children, Li began studying viruses in 1958 at Taipei's U.S. Naval Medical Research Unit 2. In 1967, after five years of research in human trials, the team successfully produced a Japanese encephalitis vaccine. Starting in 1968, Taiwan launched a comprehensive vaccination program for all children aged two and under. This caused the number of Japanese encephalitis cases to finally begin to decline. In the 1970s, public health officials would visit rural communities to vaccinate children for Japanese encephalitis, cowpox, and other diseases. In the past, children would be given vaccine shots in the buttocks because children two and under don't have developed shoulder muscles. Back then, smallpox was a very serious disease, so we all had to inject vaccines several times. The body has a strong reaction to the smallpox vaccine in the area around the injection, so in most cases, it would leave a scar. Back when Taiwan was an agrarian society, it was common to see polio-stricken children limping along on crutches. The government decided to establish three special education classes in Taidong County's Beinan Township for children with polio to continue their education while undergoing rehabilitation. Conservative estimates say that at its peak, polio infected 700 people in one year. In 1958, Taiwan began administering polio vaccines developed by U.S. researcher Jonas Salk. In 1963, imports began for a newer variant developed by U.S. researcher Albert Sabin. Government measures required all newborn children to be vaccinated, which drastically cut down the number of polio infections. By 2000, polio was officially eradicated in Taiwan. 
有时候人们会用残酷的方法去对待小儿麻痹的病人。Around the 1930s and 40s, people would be cruel toward children with polio because they were afraid that they could spread polio to others. They would send children to the outlying islands and isolate them from society. This method of dealing with the disease caused widespread panic. Sometime in the 1940s, Salk and Sabin separately developed polio vaccines. The emergence of these two polio vaccines was a major contribution to human health. Hepatitis B infections through blood transfusions or during childbirth were common. After several decades, up to two Taiwanese in ten was a carrier of the disease. In the 1980s, medical professionals began researching hepatitis and advocating for hepatitis B vaccinations. But these vaccines meant unprecedented public opposition, as they needed to be given to newborns. When this vaccine was first being rolled out, it was met with very great resistance. Many people questioned the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. There were even some people asking, why are you using our children as guinea pigs? In 1984, the government enacted nationwide hepatitis B immunization for newborns. This resulted in a huge drop in the rate of hepatitis B infections. In retrospect, that proved to be an extremely important correct decision. Back then, after we started vaccinating people, the rate of hepatitis B infection dropped from 10% to 1% in children born after 1984. Using vaccines to combat infectious diseases turned out to be very effective. However, as medicine advances, viruses also evolve. In November 2002, news broke out at China's Guangdong province about patients who would die not long after developing a cough. Chinese officials initially denied that there was a problem, blocking media from investigating or reporting on the issue. In March 2003, a disease broke out in Hong Kong that later spread to Taiwan and other countries. The World Health Organization issued a global alert, naming the mysterious disease SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. SARS spread through airborne droplets and had a high fatality rate. It plunged the world into an all-out battle against the epidemic. People wore face masks, and temperature checks were set up at building entrances. Public transit systems were sterilized, shopping centers lay deserted, businesses turned to teleconferencing, and social distancing policies took hold across the country. It was a tense atmosphere. On April 24, 2003, the Heping branch of Taipei City Hospital reported a cluster of SARS infections. Immediately, the hospital was forced into lockdown. Over 1,000 people were quarantined in the hospital for 14 days. I have to say, with SARS, there were areas in which Taiwan was successful. Our SARS cases came after those in Singapore, Hong Kong, and China. So by the time SARS reached us, the public had already been educated via television. We didn't have any super spreaders. With us, it wasn't like in Singapore, where a flight attendant infected over 100 people and caused deaths, including that of both her parents. We didn't have any super spreaders. From the start, we carried out epidemic prevention measures, which minimized our problems. In the four months between Taiwan's first confirmed case and when the epidemic was declared contained, 150,000 people were put in isolation. Among them, 664 had been infected and 73 died from the disease. SARS was caused by a coronavirus strain previously unknown to medicine. The virus was traced back to a person in China's Guangdong province who had contracted the disease from a civet. In other words, the disease had been naturally transmitted between an animal and a human. Such diseases are known as zoonoses. It goes from host A to host B. After it spreads to humans, it slowly becomes more accustomed to the human body. The viral hemagglutinin acts as a stepping stone to mutations. That way they can go in and reproduce. It can reproduce for many generations. They survive from one stage to the next. That's how it can get to spread between people. In 2005, avian flu swept Taiwan. Originally, the H5N1 virus causing the disease only affected bird species, but the virus mutated and spread to humans. H5N1 can destroy the immune system, and it has a high death toll. The disease spread to other countries through migratory birds. 
都是有点是那个造成免疫很多的发炎反应。H5N1 caused severe disease. It made the immune system respond with many inflammations. These inflammations were caused by chemical hormones, which would damage the cells in the body. These damaged cells were what caused the disease to be so severe. If you couldn't get it under control, the hormones would call other cells over and settle in one place. It's like an army blocking a road. Immune cells can't get through, and so it causes inflammations. Sometimes the host would develop immune disease, what we refer to as immune pathologies. The avian flu of 2005 dealt a staggering blow that was followed with swine flu in 2009. H1M1, the strain that caused the outbreak, had inherited genes from human, bird, and pig flu viruses to become an entirely new virus for humans. Swine flu swept over America and Asia, and the WHO eventually declared the outbreak a phase six pandemic. 2009, it's spread very fast. It's spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. The 2009 H1N1 outbreak was the first outbreak of the pandemic. It spread very fast, but it wasn't so lethal. If that virus appears in Asia at the same time as an outbreak of H5N1, the two of them could combine to become an even more powerful virus. The most worrying thing would be a disease that spreads easily across a large area and kills at a high rate. In 2013, a never-before-seen avian flu called H7N9 appeared, with China reporting the first human infections. The disease made its way over to Taiwan, although it does not have the ability to spread easily from person to person. H7N9 has not yet developed a key mutation. That is not to say that the virus will definitely be able to spread between humans after those four mutations, because there are actually six other genes that need to change. If it successfully infects a mammalian species, its rate of viral mutation may accelerate. Developing vaccines is a race against the pace of viral mutation. Even with top experts devoted to researching vaccines, the world is always vulnerable to being destroyed by the next new virus.